1, Chapter 2, Rebellion. Lorda sells her belongings. In California, there is such an abundance of immigrants that employers can pay poorly and treat them badly. Even with two jobs, she can't save. She wants to start over again in America. She and Diana move to North Carolina. In North Carolina, Lourdes quickly lands a job as a waitress at a Mexican restaurant. She finds a room to rent in a trailer home for just $150 a month, half her rent in California. Here people are less hostile. She can leave her car, even her house, unlocked. And she meets a man. He is a house painter from Honduras, and they are moving in together. He too has two children in Honduras. He is, a ki he is kind and gentle, a quiet man with good manners. He is different from the fathers of her children. He eases her loneliness. He takes Lourdes and Diana to the park on Sundays. For a while, when Lourdes works two restaurant jobs, he picks her up when her second shift ends so that they can share a few moments together. They call each other honey. They fall in love. Money from Lourdes helps Enrique, and he realizes it. Her gifts arrive steadily. She sends Enrique an orange polo shirt, a pair of blue jeans, a radio cassette player. If she were here in Honduras with him, he knows where he would probably be scavenging in the trash dump on a hilltop across town. Lourdes knows it, too. As a girl, she herself had rooted around at the dump, where scavengers, some as young as six or seven, stand in a stinking stew of oozing trash, a black cloud of buzzards circling above. She and the other scavengers would desperately sort through piles of filth just to find a piece of stale, moldy bread or some bits of plastic and tin that they could sell. Enrique sees other children who must work hard jobs, a block from where Lourdes grew up. Children gather barefoot atop a mound of sawdust left by a lumber mill. Their faces smeared with dirt. The children quickly scoop sawdust into rusty tin cans and dump it into big white plastic bags. They lug the bags half a mile up a hill. There they sell the sawdust to families who use it to kindle fires or who dry the wet mud around their houses. An 11-year-old boy has been hauling sawdust for three years, three trips up the hill each day. The earnings buy clothes, shoes, and paper for school. Lourdes is proud that her money pays Belky's tuition at a private high school and eventually a college to study accounting. In a country where nearly half live on a dollar or less a day, kids from poor neighborhoods almost never go to college. In one neighborhood near where Enrique's mother grew up, 52 children arrive at kindergarten each morning. 44 arrive barefoot. An aide reaches into a basket and places a pair of shoes into each one's hands. At 4 p.m., before they leave, the children must return the shoes to the basket. If they take the shoes home, their mothers will sell them for food. At dinner time, the mothers count out three tortillas for each child. If there are no tortillas, they try to fill their children's bellies with a glass of water with a teaspoon of sugar mixed in. Enrique knows that without money from the United States, he would be one of those children. Still, he feels he would rather be with his mother than get his money and the gifts she sends. Lourdes wants to give her son and daughter some hope. I'll be back next Christmas, she tells Enrique. In his dreams of his mother coming home in December, she stands at the door with a box of Nike shoes for him. Stay, he pleads. Live with me. He promises, when he grows up a little older, to help her work and make money. Christmas arrives, and Enrique waits by the door. She does not come. Every year she promises. Every year he is disappointed, and his anger grows. I need her. I miss her, he tells his sister. I want to be with my mother. I see so many children with mothers. I want that. When Lourdes tells him yet again that she will come home, he replies sarcastically, Va pues, sure, sure. Enrique senses the truth. Very few mothers return. He tells her that he doesn't think she is ever coming back. To himself, he says, it's all one big lie. His anger boils over. He refuses to make his Mother's Day card at school. He hits other kids and lifts girls' skirts. When a teacher tries to make him behave by smacking him with a large ruler, Enrique grabs the end of the ruler and refuses to let go, making the teacher cry. He stands on top of the de teacher's desk and bellows, Who is Enrique? You, the class replies. Three times he is suspended. Twice he repeats a grade, but he keeps his promise to study. Unlike half the children from his neighborhood, Enrique completes elementary school. There is a small graduation ceremony. A teacher hugs him and mutters, Thank God Enrique is out of here. He stands proud in a blue gown. He stands proud in a blue gown and mortarboard, but nobody from his mother's family comes to the graduation. Enrique is small, just shy of five feet, even when he straightens up from a slight stoop. He has a big smile and perfect teeth. He makes up for the vulnerability he feels inside, fueled in part by not having a parent to protect him, by putting on a tough image. He starts spending more time on the streets of Carrizal, 
which is quickly becoming one of Tegucigalpa's roughest neighborhoods. His grandmother tells him to come home early, but he plays soccer until midnight. Now he is 14, a teenager. He refuses to sell spices anymore. It is embarrassing when girls see him peddle fruit cups or when someone calls him the tamale man. When he walks to, when he walks to church alongside Grandmother Maria, he hides his Bible under his shirt so no one will know where they are headed. Soon he stops going to church at all. Sometimes Grandmother Maria pulls him out a belt when Enrique is in bed at night and unable to quickly escape her punishment. She delivers one lash for each time he has misbehaved. Don't hang out with bad boys, she scolds. You can't pick my friends, Enrique retorts. You're not even my mother. He keeps staying out late into the night. His grandmother waits up for him, crying. Why are you doing this to me, she asks. Don't you love me? I'm going to send you away. Send me. No one loves me. But she says she does love him. She only wants him to work and to be honorable so that he can hold his head up high. But the rest of Grandmother Maria's family says Enrique has to go. She is an old woman of 70, and he is too much trouble for someone her age to raise. She knows they are right. Sadly, she writes to Lourdes, you must find him another home. To Enrique, it is another rejection. First his mother, then his father, now his grandmother Maria. Lourdes arranges for her eldest brother, Marco Antonio Zabla, to take him in. Marco once took in Lourdes when their own mother was struggling to feed her and her siblings. Enrique still misses Lourdes enormously, but Uncle Marco and his girlfriend treat him well. Marco makes a good living as a money changer on the Honduran border. He is hired to exchange money from one currency to another. Marco's family, including his son, lives comfortably in a five-bedroom house in a middle-class neighborhood in, Te in the middle-class neighborhood of Tegucigalpa. Uncle Marco gives Enrique a daily allowance, buys him clothes, and sends him to a private military school in the evenings. His uncle pays as much attention to Enrique as he does his own son. Together, they play billiards and watch movies. Like his mother before him, Enrique sees New York City's spectacular skyline, Las Vegas's shimmering lights, Disneyland's magic castle on the TV screen. Uncle Marco trusts Enrique, even to do errands for him at the bank. He tells Enrique, I want you to work with me forever. Enrique senses that Uncle Marco loves him, and he values his uncle's advice. But handling paper money is dangerous in a place where money is scarce. One day, Uncle Marco's security guard is murdered after a job trading Honduran limpieras. After the guard's death, Marco swears he will never exchange money again. A few months later, though, he gets a call. For a large commission, he would exchange $50,000 in Limpiras on the border with El Salvador. Uncle Marco cannot resist. He promises that this job will be the last. Enrique wants to go with him, but Uncle Marco insists he is too young. Marco takes Victor, one of his own brothers, instead. Robbers spray their car with bullets. The car with Enrique's uncles careens off the road. The thieves shoot Uncle Marco three times in the chest and once in the leg. They shoot Victor in the face. In nine years, Lourdes has saved $700 toward bringing her children to the United States. Instead, she uses it to help pay for her brother's funeral. Marco had visited her once, shortly after she arrived in California. She had not seen Victor since leaving Honduras. Lourdes goes into a tailspin. She angrily swears off Honduras. How could she ever live in such a lawless place? People there are killed like dogs. The only way she'll go back now, she tells herself, is by force if she is deported. Soon after her brother's deaths, the restaurant where Lourdes works is raided by immigration agents. Every worker there is caught up in the sweep. Lourdes is the only one spared. It is her day off. Adrift again. Back in Honduras, within days of the two brothers' deaths, Uncle Marco's girlfriend sells Enrique's television stereo, and, and Nintendo game, all gifts from Marco. Without telling him why, she says, I don't want you here anymore. She puts his bed out on the street. Enrique, now 15, gathers his clothes and goes to his maternal grandmother, Aguera Amalia Valladeres. Can I stay here? he asks. This had been his first home, the small stucco house where he, Belki, and Lourdes lived until Lourdes stepped off the front porch. His second home was the wooden shack where he and his father lived with his father's mother until his father found a new wife and left. His third home was the comfortable house where he lived with Uncle Marco. Now he is back where he began. Seven people live here already. Besides Grandmother Regueda, there are two aunts and four young cousins. They are poor. Nonetheless, Grandmother Regueda takes Enrique in. The whole family is devastated by the murders of Uncle Marco and Uncle Victor. Enrique goes quiet, introverted. He does not return to school. He shares a bedroom with his Aunt Miriam, 
One day she awakens at 2 a.m. Enrique is, quiet, is sobbing quietly in his bed, cradling a picture of Uncle Marco in his arms. He, his uncle loved him. Without that love, he is lost. The girl next door. At Uncle Marco and Uncle Victor's funeral, Enrique notices a shy girl with cascading curls of brown hair. She lives next door with her aunt. She is an inviting smile, a warm manner. At first, the girl, Maria Isabel, can't stand Enrique. She is 17, two years older than he is. He seems arrogant to her. Enrique persists. Hoping to start a conversation, he whistles softly as she walks by. She ignores him. The more she rejects him, the more he wants her. He loves her girlish giggle, how she cries easily. He hates it when she flirts with other boys. He saves up money and buys her roses, lotions, a teddy bear, chocolates. He walks her home after school from night classes two blocks away. Slowly, Maria Isabel warms to him. The third time Enrique asks if she will be his girlfriend, she finally says yes. They understand each other. They connect. She, too, has shuffled from home to home throughout her childhood and has been separated from her parents. Maria Isabel grew up with her mother, Eva, in a borrowed hut on a Tegucigalpa mountainside. Like Enrique's mother, Eva had left an unfaithful husband. She struggled to keep the family fed. Nine people slept in the hut. To fit, they slept head to foot. Neighbors loved Maria Isabel, the sweet, loving girl who always smiled. She offered to help them with the chores and cleaning. By the time she was ten, they could already see that she was a hard worker and a fighter. Maria Isabel says, Mira, yo, yo por pereza no me muero del hambre. Look, I will never die from hunger or out of laziness. Maria Isabel graduated from the sixth grade. Her mother proudly hung the girl's elementary school graduation diploma on the wall of the hut. She knew her daughter was a good student, but she could not afford to send her to junior high. Ava herself never went to school. She began selling bread from a basket perched on her head when she was 12. At 16, Maria Isabel moved across town with her aunt Gloria, who lived next door to Enrique's grandmother, Egeda. Gloria's house is modest, but to Maria Isabel, aunt Gloria's two-bedroom home is wonderful. Besides, Gloria is more easygoing about letting Maria Isabel go out at night to an occasional dance or party or to the annual county fair. Ava wouldn't hear of such a thing, fearful the neighbors would gossip about her daughter's morals. A cousin promises to take Maria Isabel to a talk about birth control. Now that she is dating Enrique, Maria Isabel wants to prevent a pregnancy. Enrique desperately wants to get Maria Isabel pregnant. If they have a child together, he thinks, surely Maria Isabel won't abandon him. El Infiernito Grandmother Agueda quickly sours on Enrique. She is furious when he comes home late, waking up the household. Enrique has started hanging out in a neighborhood known as El Infiernito, Little Hell. Some homes there are teepees, stitched together from rags. It is controlled by the street gang Mara Salvatrucha, or MS. The Mara Salvatrucha gang members hold sway over the streets throughout much of Central America and Mexico. Here, in El Infiernito, they carry chimbas, guns made from plumbing pipes, and they drink charamilla, charamilla, diluted rubbing alcohol. They rob bus passengers and assault churchgoers after mass. Enrique and his friend Jose del Carmen Bustamante, 16, venture into El Infiernito. They quickly buy marijuana, making sure to leave El Infiernito, which is dangerous. They sit outside a billiard hall, listening to music drift through the open doors. Lately, the boys have been inhaling glue late into the night, getting high off the fumes. They talk about what it would be like to ride on top of trains to El Norte. In Enrique's marijuana haze, train riding sounds like an adventure. He doesn't even care if there are migra agents shooting overhead and bandits waiting to rob him. He and Jose resolve to try it soon. Enrique tries to hide his drug habit from his family and Maria Isabel. One day, Maria Isabel turns a street corner and bumps into him. She is overwhelmed. He smells like an open can of paint. What's that? she asks, reeling away from the fumes. Are you on drugs? No, Enrique says. One night, Aunt Miriam walks, wakes up to the sound of rustling plastic and a strong chemical smell. Through the dimness, she sees Enrique in his bed, puffing on a bag. He is sniffing glue. This is the last straw. The family kicks him out of the house to live in the little stone cooking shack just behind the house. His grandmother, Agueda, used to prepare food here over an open fire. The walls and ceilings are still charred black. The single window has steel bars like a prison cell, and there is no electricity. Now, living alone, Enrique can do whatever he wants. If he is out all night, no one cares. 
But to him, getting kicked out of the house feels like another rejection. Maria Isabel sees him change. Drugs make, make his mouth sticky. He's always jumpy and nervous. His eyes grow red. Sometimes they are glassy, half-closed. Other times he looks drunk. When he is high, he is quiet, sleepy, and distant. When he comes crashing down from his high, he becomes hysterical and short-tempered. Sometimes Enrique hallucinates that someone is chasing him. For two especially bad weeks, he doesn't recognize family members. His hands tremble. He coughs black phlegm. His grandmother points to a neighbor with pale, scaly skin who has sniffed glue for a decade. The man can no longer stand up. Look, that's how you're going to end up, Grandmother Regeta tells Enrique. Drago, one of his aunts calls him, drug addict. A test run. When Enrique turned 16, he and Jose tried train hopping for the first time. To get to the United States, Enrique will have to travel north through Honduras, then Guatemala, and finally Mexico. Enrique and Jose slip past guards into Tapachula, Mexico's southernmost train depot. Just before they reach the train tracks, police stop them. Enrique prays he and Jose will not be deported back to Guatemala. Then they would have to sneak back over the Mexican border. The officers rob them, but fortunately do not arrest them. Enrique and Jose find another train. They clamber aboard as it crawls out of the Tapachula station. Jose is terrified. Enrique is feeling brave. He jumps from car to car on the slow-moving train. He slips and falls, away from the tracks, luckily, and lands on his backpack, which is padded with a shirt and extra pair of pants. He scrambles aboard again, but their journey comes to a humiliating halt. Near Tier Tierra Blanca, a town in the south-central Mexican state of Veracruz, authorities snatch them from the top of a, tr of a freight car. This time, the officers don't care about bribes. They take the boys to a cell filled with Marasalvatrucha gangsters, then deport them. Enrique is bruised and limping from the fall, and he misses Maria Isabel. He and Jose ride back to Central America in what migrants call El Bus de Lagrimas, the Bus of Tears. The bus unloads migrants back across the Rio Suchiate in the rugged town of El Carmen. The river marks the border between Guatemala and Mexico, just as the Rio Grande defines the border between Mexico and the United States up north. These buses make as many as eight runs a day, deporting more than 100,000 unhappy passengers every year. A decision. It is January 2000. Enrique has sunk deeper into drugs. Enrique promises Maria Isabel he will quit. He is sick of feeling out of control. He owes money to drug dealers and lives in constant fear of their death threats. He is caught stealing Aunt Rosa Amalia's jewelry. He was going to sell it to pay his dealer back. Aunt Rosa Amalia is furious. Her husband, Enrique's uncle Carlos, recognizes that the boy is troubled. He doesn't want Enrique in jail. He just wants him to shape up. Uncle Carlos finds Enrique a job at a tire store. He tells the family they must show Enrique love. They must be patient with him. Quitting drugs is harder than Enrique expected, though. He slips back into old habits. He tries to cut back on drugs, but then he gives in to them. Every night, he comes home later. Maria Isabel begs him not to go up the hill where he sniffs glue, but he does anyway. He looks at himself in disgust. He is dressing like a slob. His life is unraveling. Even Enrique's sister and grandmother have urged Maria Isabel to leave Enrique, to find someone better. What do you see in him, they ask her. Don't you see he uses drugs? Maria Isabel tries to give him support. When they walk by his drug haunts, she holds his hand tighter, hoping it will help. Why don't you leave your vices, she asks. It's hard, he answers quietly. She loses herself at Enrique. She can't leave him, despite his deep flaws. He is macho and stubborn. When they fight, he gives her the silent treatment. He leaves it up to her to break the ice. More often than not, she gives in. He is her third boyfriend, but her first love. Enrique also provides a refuge from her own problems. Her aunt Gloria's son is an alcoholic. He throws things. He steals things. Enrique is her escape from fights at home. Enrique's shame eats at him. He feels guilt for what he has done to his family and what he is doing to Maria Isabel. He is clear-headed enough to tell Belki that he knows what he has to do. He has to go find his mother. She is his salvation. Maria Isabel pleads with him to stay. She might be pregnant. She tells Enrique she will move into the stone hut with him. He, she won't abandon him, but Enrique fears if he stays in Honduras right now, he will end up on the streets or dead. His own family is sick of him. They think he is sullying the only thing the family owns, its good name. His aunt Ana Lucia, Lourdes's sister, speaks bitter words. Where are you coming from, you old bum? Aunt Ana Lucia asks as Enrique walks in the door. 
coming home for food, huh? Be quiet, he says. I'm not asking anything of you. You are a lazy bum, a drug addict. No one wants you here, Aunt Anna Lucia yells. All the neighbors can hear. This isn't your house. Go to your mother. Enrique pleads in a low voice with his aunt to be quiet. Finally, he snaps. He kicks Aunt Anna Lucia twice, squarely in the buttocks. She shrieks. His grandmother, Agueda, runs out of the house. She grabs a stick and threatens to club him if he touches Anna Lucia again. No one cares about me, he screams, running away. Now even his grandmother wishes he would go to the United States. He is hurting the family and himself. She says he'll be better off there. Saying goodbye, Enrique decides he will make the journey to the United States by himself. There is no way he can scrape together $5,000 for a smuggler. He sells the few things he owns, his bed and the leather jacket Uncle Marco gave him, so he will have money for food along the way. He crosses town to say goodbye to Grandmother Maria. Trudging up the hill to her house, he runs into his father. I'm leaving, Enrique says. I'm going to make it in the United States. He asks Luis for some money. Luis gives him enough change for a soda and wishes him luck. Enrique wasn't really expecting much more from his father. Grandma, I'm leaving, Enrique says when he arrives at his grandmother Maria's shack. I'm going to find my mom. Grandmother Maria pleads with him not to go, but he has made up his mind. She gives him a hundred lempiras, about seven dollars, all the money she has, and kisses his forehead. I'm leaving already, sis, Enrique tells Belki the next morning. Belki feels her stomach tighten. They have lived apart most of their lives, but he is the only one who understands her loneliness. Quietly, she fixes him a special meal. Tortillas, a pork cutlet, rice, fried beans with a sprinkling of cheese. Don't leave, she says, tears welling up in her eyes. I have to. Every time Enrique has talked to his mother, she has warned him not to come. It's too dangerous. But if somehow he gets to the U.S. border, he will call her. If I call her from there, he says to his friend Jose, how can she not accept me? He makes himself one promise. Only after a year of trying to get to his mother in the United States will he give up and go back. Enrique, a kid with a boyish grin, fond of kites, spaghetti, soccer, and breakdancing, who likes to play in the mud and watch Mickey Mouse cartoons with his four-year-old cousin, quietly packs up his belongings. Corduroy pants, a t-shirt, a cap, gloves, a toothbrush, and toothpaste. For a long moment, he looks at a picture of his mother, but he does not take it. He might lose it. He writes her telephone number on a scrap of paper. Just in case, he also scrawls it in ink on the inside waistband of his pants. He has $57 in his pocket. On March 2, 2000, he goes to Grandmother Agueda's house. He stands on the same porch that his mother disappeared from 11 years before. He hugs Maria Isabel and Aunt Rosa Amalia. Then he steps off.